packets, uh, we all have seen looms before, right? It's kind of a common thing, but I, put, I included this chart for you guys just because I thought it was really a cool way to look at it. It kind of goes through um, products, right? So one of the best ways to differentiate can be your product, right? What the students are creating, that kind of that end result. And so it had a really good list of like what product matches each of those levels of looms. So I thought that was just kind of a fun resource to look at. Give you a second to just look that over. It also has kind of just those trigger words. I think we see those a lot on the pyramids, right? It always has the levels and then the trigger words, but I've never really seen products assigned to it. So I just kind of like that it gave you some idea. When we think about differentiation, right? Product is just one of the ways that we can look at how we differentiate, but the the Content and the process are two other ways. So content is what the students are learning, right? So sometimes you have students who are not quite ready for the content that you're at, and there's kind of different ways to scaffold that for them, right? Build them up to be ready for it. Sometimes you have students like gifted learners who are past the content, right? They've already mastered it. They already know that material. Process is kind of that thing in the middle that you're doing, right? Like how are you getting students where they need to be? So that can be differentiated as well. In your packets, we gave you this really great resource, and the gifted department actually uses it as a walkthrough document. So if you kind of flip through, it looks like this has a blue top. And it goes through content, process, and product. And I just love this resource because it gives you all sorts of things to look for in your classroom to know whether you're differentiating at those different levels. And if you're not yet, it gives you some ideas about how to do that, right? So what, what would it look like if I was differentiating content? What would it look like if I was differentiating process? And what would it look like if I was differentiating a product? So this is actually what Joanna uses, right, when she goes into classrooms to kind of look for that differentiation. So I just also think it's a great resource for anyone, right, not just teachers of gifted students, but teachers of all students. We all have to differentiate in our classroom, right? We all have those varying levels. So this is kind of a nice little checklist of, of what that looks like. And a lot of times teachers will comment, because we tend to be hard on ourselves. You know, we're never doing enough. And even though we are doing enough, and this is a great tool because a lot of times teachers will say to me, well, I didn't really think this lesson was that differentiated. And then I'll show them all the areas of differentiation that, that were covered in that lesson. So it's, it's just a good, almost like a little cheat sheet yeah. to see, hey, am I hitting different areas of differentiation? Yes, okay. Well, I was just going to add, I really appreciate, um, for those of us like Joanna said, who started teaching in the 90s, um, when differentiation came out, it was always content, process, and product. But I love, and I'd like to see it added and then sent out, Yes. Um, how you included on that first side learning environment. Because I think that that's the one thing over and over again that teachers are having to do is really provide differentiation in the learning environment for our students so that they are able to access the curriculum in a different way. Rather than I'm not seeing as much anymore of the content, process, and product. So. I would like to add it And box. you know what? I'm wondering, let me see the one that we gave you. If you look at the bottom, because you know whatever you wish for, we produce. I know, that's what I'm asking. Because at the bottom, we have the social emotional learning, and it does say learning environment addresses what's called OE, yes, over excitabilities. <laughs> think over excitabilities. I'm sure you're like, oh yeah, I think I have that point on in my classroom. <laughs> Um, because Carrie's exactly right. There's so much we can do within our room environment to help those students who um, may need extra support in social emotional learning. So yes, I love that. With some specific examples. <laughs> I, I'm writing it down on a post-it right now. Go okay. ahead, Teresa Martin, what were you going to say? So the things that come to my mind are the senses, like putting the smells in the room, putting on the calm music, calm down corner that has different variety of like little pillow or little stuffed animals or fidgets, those kind of things, the plants in the room, the wiggles, different flexible seatings, those kind of things are what I think in that area. Oh yeah, this spoiler alert. Seating. Like oh. some kids need to stand, some kids need to wiggle, just little cushions. And you know what we could do? Because I could send, if, if you're interested in some examples of alternative seating and what, what we do with learning environment, email me. 
because I'm out and about in all these wonderful classrooms, and like Teresa said, any of our teachers could say, hey, I do this, or I have a standing desk, or I have whatever. Um, but there's lots of ideas out there. And this is one of your fabulous prize giveaways. Um, Self-regulation in the classroom. This is the book Lacey and I use when we teach characteristics of gifted students. But it's not just for gifted students, people. It's, it's for all students. So this is one of the things that you can win today. And it's full of ideas. But yes, Carrie, I put your idea on a post-it. I'm going to implement it. Thanks, Val. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you um, have SEL or self-regulation and need to go after that, then not going to give you a brilliant ideas for that, absolutely. All right, so in your packet, you guys have this one. We kind of were just looking at this, right? It's Carrie and Joanna. So at the top, it kind of goes through content process products. What is that, right? We've already talked about that. But then what does it look like for students, right? For students, it kind of translates to, like, readiness. Are they ready for what you're teaching? Interest. Are they interested in it in some way, right? Like, can we build that interest in the student? Sometimes we, well, all the time, we don't have any control over our standards, right? We have to teach that. But there's different ways to build interest in there for students, right? Whether it's giving them some choice in the product or some choice in how they present that information or how they research it. Sometimes you can play with content a little bit depending on your classroom, right? And then learning profile is what we just talked about, right? Like, what kind of learner you are. So. If you flip backwards in the packet a little bit, you have these two pages to read. And they're really to help you fill out this readiness piece. So you're really going to start reading right where it says readiness, right here. OK. We're, and one of the things that we love, of course, is collaboration. And it's so much easier to do like a curriculum differentiation chart when you're working with your peers. So. That's one of the reasons you will have some time today to kind of dive in. But um, my understanding is this afternoon you'll have more time as well. Um, some of the content area and grade levels will have more time to work on stuff. Because you can bring this back to your site and say, hey, do you want to do a differentiation chart together? It's a little easier when you have two or three brains working together. OK, we're going to jump into Another one of the favorite resources we have that we that all of us, if you've gone through the gate courses, we learned about depth and complexity. But one of the things I hear across the district, because we have 50 gate teachers in the district that are working with gate students, but we actually have over 200 that are gate endorsed. And the reason I'm such a proponent of the gate endorsement coursework and the classes is because it is all about differentiation. It's not just here for gifted students. It's really all about differentiation. And one of um, my favorite educators is the fabulous Cheryl Macy. And she never had a gate classroom, but when she went through and got her gate endorsement, she said, Joanna, my go-to was depth and complexity. So depth and complexity is a wonderful resource whatever level of learner you have. So whatever content, whatever grade level, um, if you're gay, if you're not gay, it has all of these resources. And guess what? They're part of our fabulous prize giveaway too. So yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, and it's going to feel like a wave. If you've never heard of it, you're going to be like, what is she talking about? So it's going to kind of feel like a wave of information. And then we're going to give you some applications. So when you think of depth and complexity, it's basically a framework that's all about differentiation. Um, it adjusts how students approach the content. And the prompts are part of a longer equation. You're differentiating thinking skills, content, resources, and product. And you might have seen these icons up in classrooms. This is also part of the Fabulous Prize, people. Um, and these icons actually have ideas on the back. And one of the things that's great about these, speaking of visual learners, is a lot of teachers, when students are note-taking, like I saw this in the Fabulous Danielle Bohol's room last uh, week, she has an avid note-taker hooked to depth and complexity. 
where students are using the depth and complexity icons to actually note type. And I actually saw it to Carrie Pryor, Fremont Vice Principal. Shannon Slayman was doing it where it wasn't a pre, it wasn't a note taker that she passed out to the students, but the students were note taking and using the icons as they took notes. So um, it, it, it's a great resource. And you'll get prizes all about this resource. Thank you. Okay, now I love a little bit of a history lesson. If you're like, what is this depth and complexity? Why is it so great? Um, Depth and complexity, and that's another resource book. And I have all these resource books at PVC. So if you're ever like, hey, Joanna, you talked about this resource. Can you send it to me? Yes, you can check out any of these resources from PVC. But the history of depth and complexity, it was created by Dr. Sandra Kaplan in California because she wanted high achieving and gay students within the regular classroom to be challenged, and she created it for a regular classroom. It wasn't created just for gifted students, and it's that icon-driven or image-driven program, raising expectations and the level of thinking for all students. It's not just for gifted students. Um, when you hear depth, depth is a process of thought that seeks generalizations and universal pr principles and they have icons to represent all of those. Um, and complexity is the quality or process of thinking that combines many ideas or parts into interrelated holes. So when you hear depth and complexity, that's what it means. We're trying to go deeper into the content and trying to connect the content. So we, that, that's basically what it means. Okay, and if you need, I'm gonna go over this pretty quickly since it's already 820. So I'm gonna go over it pretty quickly, and if you're like, Joanna, I kinda of need that information as I dive in, just email me and I can send you the whole Google slide presentation. Um, depth and complexity, this is from the book that's gonna be part of our fabulous prize, Gifted Guild's Guide to Depth and Complexity. This gives ideas for every icon and how you can use it in the classroom. So when it says Bloom's depth of knowledge, this is taught, this is digging deeper using Bloom's. Um, it's designed for all students, like I already said. The goal is for them to be using the knowledge like an expert in the field. So if you were an engineer, if you were an architect, or whatever field you are, the idea is that these are the thinking processes that experts in the field use. So we're teaching students to think like an expert in the field. Um, names and icons, like I already said, there's a visual picture, what they call an icon, for every thought process. So it's great for note taking, it's great when you're thinking, talking about a book or whatever, um, you can hook it to these icons. And like I said, classroom use. You can integrate the expert's way of thinking in your, your lessons to ensure students are moving toward that expert level. Okay. Yeah, I always have more information. So overview continues. So this, this is just some more about the icons, the images. This is kind of like that next level. If you're like, Joanna, I need the next level. This, if you just email me, I'll send this all to you, but this just kind of talks about the icons, the icons are the images, they act as a visual trigger, so when your students see the image, they recognize, they will know the thinking that it represents. Last week when I was at Fremont, it, one of the lessons was a math lesson, and the teacher was saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, which icons would be good for us to use? And the students were like, I'm going to use this one. I'm going to use this one. I'm going to use this one. So it's just a way to frame that thing. OK, go ahead, please. OK, now we're going to jump into the fun part. I copied, uh, it, and it seems like a lot of pages, 16 to 22. But it really isn't, because there's not much writing on each page. So you're going to dive in, and you are going to do two things. You are going to read pages 16 to 22, and you also have 
two resources here, which is called Facilitating the Understanding of Depth and Complexity. And this just shows you the icon and gives you a little more information on the icon. Because we're actually going to do an activity where you get to use the icon. It's going to be fun. So we're going to give you probably, what would you say, maybe 10 minutes? Yeah, I think that's about right. We're going to give you 10 minutes to just read briefly through Gifted Guild's guide, two steps. Um, read those pages, and then we're, you're going to um, just kind of look through the depth and complexity icons and ideas, and then we're going to do a fun depth and complexity activity that you can do with kids. So go ahead. Jump into depth and complexity. This book goes through how to teach students all of the icons, but one of the easiest ways to do it is with the Peabody Bill. And we just actually, I just actually saw this in the fabulous Allison Hoffman class. And it was so funny because Allison introduced, well, was that their introduction to depth and complexity? Yes. Yeah. It was their introduction to depth and complexity and I was out and about in her classroom. If you ever want to see a fabulous teacher, go see Allison Haas. There's so many great teachers out there. That's one of the reasons I love my job. I get to go see all of you. And every room I go in and I'm like, everybody needs to see you. So yeah. So anyhow, Allison is doing the Peabody Ducks. And then Lacey and I, it was so funny because Lacey had already talked about using Peabody Ducks. And I'm like, oh, I just saw it in Allison group. So take it away, Lacey. I love this in my classroom. So if you guys don't know about the Peabody Desk, you're about to, so we're going to watch the video. So in your packet, you have this little note taker that we created. So there's actually <coughs> 10 icons. We just picked six to put on this note taker just for the sake of time. But you really can do all 10 icons with the Peabody Desk. So what happens is the students watch the video, and as they go through the video, they answer these questions. And the questions obviously relate to the icon. So for big idea. Who would you recommend this video to and why? Okay, so they answer that as they walk. Then, details. What descriptive details can you use to describe the duck palace? Language of the discipline. Define the word duck master. Use it in a meaningful sentence. And then, ethics. Is the Peabody duck tradition ethical? Decide. Multiple perspectives. Describe the Peabody duck tradition from the duck's point of view. Seeing it from the person point of view. And then across disciplines, what connections can you make between the ducks and either a story you have read, a science lesson you learned, or a historical event? So I also have used Peabody Ducks with a variety of grade levels, right? I've done this with fifth graders. I did this in my middle school classroom. Um, Joanna, have you seen it with younger? Yes, Allison is second. Awesome, second yeah. grade. So it really is a, a pretty usable tool across grade levels. So, anything else you want to add or should we no. watch the video? Let's jump in. One of the ways that we have used the Peabody Ducks is you can have the students watch it once, you can have them watch it twice. There's little snippets like the one Allison shared. It's just the snippet of them marching to the fountain. And then you can talk about all these different things. What vocabulary do you need to know? Like on the one in Allison's room, he has a, what did he call it? He has some sort of like a staff. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. But it's a great way for you to talk about vocabulary. It's a great way for you to talk about ethics with the students. You know, how do you feel about having, even though they're rotated every three months, how do you feel? And then you can dig into where's my, one of my favorites is multiple perspectives, where everybody approaches things differently. And so what's your perspective on the Peabody Ducks? So any questions on how you can use this? Because like I'm looking at our time, we have about 17 minutes. Any questions on depth and complexity or the Peabody depth? Go ahead, Elsa. If I can just add, it was cool to see the kids realize, because we just watched it first, just a little clip, and they could, whatever they got from it, they got from it. But then we talked about the details I found. So I told them, now watch it with that kind of thought in your head, you're looking for detail. And it was cool to see the kids get excited about, oh, I'm getting, I got more from it this time because I was looking for those details. It kind of makes them want to use the icons more. Even if I don't bring it up, they were talking about finding details in math story problems. So it was cool to see them kind of take ownership of the icons after that. Yeah, and I 
love that you brought that up because that's always the goal. We want the students using these, not just having them posters on the wall, but students using them or language of the dis disciplines, pulling out vocabulary. Or like I said, two of my, two of my favorites were always multiple perspectives and ethics. Well, and it trains them for other videos, right? So you start with this, but then say you're a social studies teacher, you show them a video and social studies content and they know to do that, right? They're like, oh, I saw these ethics issues and like the big picture is this, but I think about these details, right? Like this is a good way just to kind of do it in a fun way so that they kind of get prepared to do it with more content-based Go ahead, go ahead, Teresa. In first grade, I really like using them across the different subjects as well. And the kids are really like language or discipline with kind of personal videos because you're using those academic vocabulary. And they use that now with each other. And someone will use a science word and they're like, oh, I'm going to look at this in my language and they get all language and discipline. Like you sound like a scientist. So first graders can do it too and get excited about it. And the great thing about the icons, they don't have to write language of the discipline <laughs> or vocabulary. They can just write the little icon, which are the lips. And you just show them an easy way to draw lips, boom. An easy way to draw a flower, or an easy way to remember details and multiple perspectives. It's just an easy way for them to access the content. And I used to always have like little cutouts of them, right? Like at, at different grade levels. And so like they always have little piles they could go get. Like, oh, I saw language of the discipline, so I glued that picture on, you know, to like that article where I included it in my project. Great idea. Any other questions about the definition? Okay, our last thing, and like Lacey and I said, we could have kept you here all morning because there's so much we could share. But the last thing that we wanted to talk about, Lacey alluded to when she was talking about the different ways that we can tier learning. And you will hear the term passion projects, genius hour, Dr. Joseph Renzulli calls them type three investigations. Basically, it's when you give students an opportunity to investigate something they're passionate about I know that at um, Eagle Valley Middle School, I was talking to Dr. Tanya Scott last week, and her daughter is at EVMS and is doing a cancer a fundraiser for cancer because of a passion project in her classroom. So passion projects are a great way for students to kind of jump into something that's meaningful to them. And we're not going to have time to show the Dr. and Julie video, but the whole key is when students are in, engaged, enthusiastic, and encouraged to take ownership, their achievement goes up. So it's all about finding what they're passionate about. And we have some resources for you. You are going to get to have some time to, oh yeah, let's show those. Those are awesome. Oh, these are amazing. So if you love passion projects, these are two amazing resources. The school-wide enrichment model is Dr. Renzulli's book, full of ideas. Um, Genius Hour in the Classroom, this is one of the books, if you take your, the gate endorsement courses, this is one of the books you get for free. And it walks you through Genius Hour in the Classroom. So that's a resource that you can look at. The last thing that's in your packet, this is these are the classes if you're like i want to get some of these ideas and i want more on differentiation this is our cohort two schedule for the gate endorsement classes but we'll be launching a new cohort in august right lately september yeah so if you're interested in taking the gate courses email me and we'll get you on the list because basically the gate endorsement work you will come away with so many ideas on how to differentiate so, fabulous prize, and then you're going to have some time to look into it. Okay, and your fabulous prize options are gifted guilds to um, depth and complexity. We have two depth and complexity posters and self-regulation in the classroom, which Carrie Pryor was talking about, SEL, all these ideas. So here we go. Here they see you, you can do it. I'll shake you drop them. Isabel Manzano. Isabel Manzano, you're the winner. Come on up. Come on up. We get to choose one, two, three, four, six people. Okay, we've got Allison. Allison! And Allison, you might have all of these already. I don't think I have the Franklin one. This one? 
You have the food. Oh, gee. Thank you. 